Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I noticed a lot of the previous speakers had a more recent picture of themselves than I've chosen, but uh, you'll have to look at me from my youth. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a paper we published earlier this year, and then I'll take you on to some more uh, recent research that Casey Banquet, uh, a postdoc on the Better LE program from Marine Science, and I have been doing. Uh, and I'll, I'll also mention Pete Carr, one of the co-authors on, on this study who's here in the audience and knows a lot more about birds than I do. Okay, I've been lucky enough to work in Chagos since 2006, so not as long as Charles and Anne. Uh, I don't think I was born when Charles first got out there. Uh, but I have got a, a bit of a history. I've been on five expeditions, and a lot of my early work was really investigating the, the reef uh, uh, ecosystems and, uh, and the reef ecology, particularly from the perspective of reef fish. One thing I wanted to do was understand how Chagos, this large wilderness area, sits compared to other locations across, uh, across the Indian Ocean. So in this study, we compared eight different countries across the Indian Ocean. Uh, in each country, we had reefs that were fished and reefs that were in protected areas, so they were unfished. And then we compared the biomass, the amount of fish or the weight of fish on those reefs compared to Chagos. And Chagos really blew things out, uh, out of the water. Now, the color on these bars depicts body size. So the darker yellows, oranges, and reds are increasing body size of those fish. And so the higher biomass in Chagos was really driven by those larger fish, and that includes some herbivores, so big parrotfish, and a lot of big predators. Those fish are quite mobile, so the smaller protected areas across the Indian Ocean don't protect them particularly well. But I was lucky enough on these expeditions to, to be on board with uh, ornithologists, uh, Pete Carr on a, number of those, on a number of those trips, and I got to learn about how special Chagos is uh, on some of the islands as well. You can set foot on some of the islands and, and the bird life is just phenomenal. There's 10 import, internationally important bird areas in, in Chagos, whereas other islands have next to no seabirds, and that's due to introduced rats, invasive rats, that arrived in the territory in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And it's chalk and cheese. Can we have some sound on there, please? On the islands where there's no rats, the skies are full. There's seabirds uh, everywhere, many different um, species of seabird. Uh, the island stinks. So you go on the island and, and it's really pungent, particularly if it's just rained. You can really smell the, the, the guano or the bird poo in the air. Uh, and it's very noisy. Unfortunately, the, the sound isn't on for some reason, but, but it's incredibly noisy. The birds are squawking. It's, it's a really lively place to, to set foot. Whereas you can set foot on an adjacent island where there's rats, and it's completely different. The skies are empty. It smells great. <laughs> and it's really quiet. So if you could hear the sound, you can actually hear the very small waves lapping on the beach there because the, the birds aren't, aren't drowning that sound out. So, it's, so it's, it's completely different. But these islands can be very similar in other ways in terms of their size or their location in the archipelago. Now, the key thing is that these seabirds, most of them are flying great distances out into the open ocean, and they're feeding on, on oceanic fish, so small fish that, that, that feed out in the open ocean. Here's a booby chasing down a, a flying fish, a phenomenal photo. Then they return to the, to the islands where they roost and they breed and, and they deposit a lot of those nutrients that they've taken from the open ocean onto the island itself. So there, there's this big transport of nutrients from the open ocean back onto the islands between these two different ecosystems. And there's been some wonderful research done in New Zealand and, uh, and off California and, and, and in the far, uh, far north uh, showing how this can influence island ecosystems, so the, the growth of invertebrates, the abundance of plants and productivity of islands. But we didn't know a great deal about how that may influence near shore marine environments, particularly coral reefs, uh, which, is, which is what I got particularly interested in. So we went back out in 2015. Pete Carr was on the expedition and resurveyed uh, uh, seabird populations. And we chose six islands with rats and six islands with no rats. Okay? And this is the density of seabirds that, that, we, that we found on, on, the, on those different types of islands. And you can see it's huge. This is a log scale. So you can see the numbers here go up to the thousands. There was over 760 times more seabirds on the islands where there was no rats compared to the islands where there were rats. It's, it's this incredible difference. And, and the photos and videos I showed you really speak to that. <clears throat> 
We then went down to the family level. There's 14 species of birds among these different families here. And we looked at the weight or the biomass of these birds. These are the islands with no rats. These are the islands with rats. And you can see the darker colors mean there's more biomass, so there's more weight of these seabirds. And again, you can see how they, you know, they, most of the birds are on the islands with, with, with no rats, lots of noddies, lots of terns, lots of boobies, and on some islands, lots of shearwaters that, that ground nest and burrow. Now, we wanted to know the biomass at a species level because then we could convert this into the amount of nitrogen that these birds are bringing onto the islands. Now, other people, thankfully we didn't have to, have sat around watching how fast these birds poo, the rate at which they, they deposit guano onto the islands. And they've, so, so we know how fast these, the, these birds poo, we know the body size of the birds, and we know the amount of nitrogen in, in, in the guano. And from that, we could calculate the nitrogen input, which was about 250 times greater onto the islands with no rats. And this is a lot of nitrogen. This is a similar amount of nitrogen that farmers dump onto sugarcane uh, farms in the tropics, which, which is a really, uh, a, you know, a really inefficient way to farm, where they have to dump a huge amount of nitrogen onto their fields. So these seabirds are fertilizing those islands. Now, we wanted to know whether this nitrogen, this, these nutrients were leaching off the islands onto the reef and how far that went. So on the islands themselves, we collected samples of soil and new growth leaves. On the reef flat, we collected sponges and, and macroalgae, the, this halomeda. And out on the reef crest, we collected this turf algae that fish love to eat and some small herbivorous fish, the fish that eat that algae. Now, this reef crest habitat was on average about 250 meters offshore. So it's a fair way off the island. It's beginning to mix with the open ocean. So we, we were really wondering whether this nitrogen signal would get all the way out there. We used stable isotopes of, of nitrogen to be able to trace the source of that, of, of, of that nitrogen, where it's coming from. And these plots de de depict the, 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 the stable isotopes of nitrogen, but it was highly correlated with the amount of nitrogen as well. So what you're looking at really is the amount of nitrogen that's going onto the reefs and, and the source. Now, for the soil, on the islands with rats, uh, the, the, this is the signal of, uh, of nitrogen, and this is the islands with no rats. So, so there's a huge effect size. There's a huge difference of the amount of nitrogen that's going onto those, onto those islands. And this is a very similar signal to what you find in pure guano. So, this, so that's really picking up that signal quite nice, as you would expect. As we went across that spectrum, you can see that the size of the effect gets smaller, and that's because a lot of that nitrogen is getting sucked up by organisms on the reef flat. They, 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 it's a biological filter where they're, they're all using that nitrogen for growth, for reproduction, and, and, and so on. But the difference between the, the islands with and without rats is still there. We're still seeing that, that, that signal, of that fertilization effect right out onto the reef crest. Next, uh, from the herbivorous fish that, we, that we'd caught, we extracted the ear bones out of those fish. So they're, they're called otoliths. Now, fish ear bones are amazing things in that they lay down these, these growth rings, these annual rings, so you can tell how old they are, much like a tree does. So by knowing accurately how long the fish is, which, which we, we measured, uh, and their age, you can then determine their growth rate and their size for a given age. And that's exactly what we did. So in this plot, the open symbols and the dash line are, are these fish caught on the reefs off the islands with seabirds, and these filled circles and the solid line uh, are, are the fish next to islands with rats. And what we found was that the, the fish are growing faster and they're larger for a given age when, they, when they're living next to islands with lots of seabirds. And, and that's amazing. So th this is the first time that, um, that this nutrient subsidy has been shown to change the demographics, change the growth rate of a vertebrate, never mind uh, a, a marine organism. So it's really boosting the productivity of these fish. We then swam standardized underwater visual surveys of the entire fish community to get a feel for, for, for if, if these effects were propagating across the community. And, and we found that, that there was a, a substantial effect. In this plot, if this dot here is above the blue line, then the biomass of those fish is greater uh, uh, next to the islands with seabirds compared to the islands with rats. And these are different feeding groups of fish. So corallivores feed on coral, planktivores feed on, on plankton, herbivores feed, feed on algae. And you can see that there's, there's a big effect there, particularly for the herbivores. 
and it's not small. So we estimate that about, there's about 50% more fish biomass adjacent to the islands with seabirds compared to the islands with rats. So that's a huge effect. And put that, put that in context that we're in a remote place where there's no fishing on these reefs, and yet the biomass is enhanced by 50% in the absence of any other human influence. So these seabirds are having a huge influence on the boost in the productivity of these systems. We also looked at the, the, the rate at which uh, parrotfish graze the reef, so they, they clean the reef of algae, allowing new corals to settle, and the rate at which they bioerode the reef, where, where they break down dead coral, and that gets rid of the, the, the weak structures, and it provides up to 70%, 75% of the sand that builds the islands themselves. And those key processes were enhanced between three and four times adjacent to the islands with, with the seabirds. So it really is a huge effect boosting the productivity and the functioning of the whole system. Now this paper came out uh, in, I think it was May this year. This, we got the cover of Nature, which was great, particularly as this photo was taken in Chagos by John Slayer, who's in the audience somewhere. Uh, so, so it was great to, 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 to get a bit of exposure about the work and, and around the science going on in, in, in Chagos there. And then I went back out to Chagos with Casey uh, in May this year to go back to these reefs and, and, and the questions we're asking relate to how, how these different reefs with rats versus seabirds have responded to the 2016 coral bleaching event. Bob Crawford, our expedition medic there, looking very John, uh, James Bond-esque, is somewhere in the audience as well, I think. Um, and we went back to the islands that, that we've looked at. We're working on the lagoonal side uh, of the islands and one thing that was Quite interesting was that Salomon Atoll, so the lagoonal side of Salomon, that's the most enclosed atoll that we look at, um, lost uh, no coral at all in the bleaching event, at least on the sites we looked at, which is really reassuring. Uh, I think maybe because it's so enclosed, it experiences more temperature fluctuations naturally and, and the, the corals are, are capable of surviving much bigger drops in coral cover in Parispanos and the Great Chagos Bank. Then, so if we put all of our data together here, we've got um, uh, the, the sites with seabirds in blue and the sites uh, uh, with rats in red. And then we've got pre-bleaching, so 2015 data, and post-bleaching, that's 2018 data. And you can see that there, was, uh, the, the, there was no difference really in the amount of coral that was lost overall if you compared uh, ratty islands versus birdie islands. But one of the, the biggest differences we found was this explosion in the cover of uh, crustose coralline algae, this, this encrusting red algae that you can see there, and in Halamida, again, it's a, it's a calcifying algae. Uh, and that's quite interesting. CCA can be quite important for coral recovery. Re coral recruits like to settle into it. Uh, Halamida, we're not quite sure what's going to unfold uh, in the future, whether that will uh, disappear or, or whether it's going to continue to dominate some of those reefs. In terms of fish, um, we, we found some, some uh, different patterns. So some of those fish, planktivores and corallivores, so uh, plankton feeding fish that tend to live, the small fish that live above live coral and, uh, and corallivores that feed on live coral saw big drops in biomass. And that was particularly true for the, uh, the, the islands with seabirds. They had further to fall. So, 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 so we saw those big drops. That's, that's part, partly why I think. Um, but we also saw the higher biomass being maintained for some of these really important groups, like the herbivores uh, and, uh, and the piscivores, so, which is reassuring that the processes that they're providing to the system is, uh, is being enhanced and maintained on those islands with seabirds. Okay, so just to, to sum up, um, I think rat eradication really is a, a, a low-hanging fruit for conservation somewhere like Chagos. It, it would have a huge impact on the terrestrial environment and on the marine environment. It's not difficult to do, it's not going to cost a huge amount of money, and, and I think in terms of conservation somewhere like Chagos, it would, be, it would be huge. Just to give you a few of those figures that I've been through in the talk, between the islands with rats and no rats, there was a 750 times more seabirds where there's no rats, 250 times more nitrogen brought to the islands by the seabirds. The fish are growing faster. There's about 50% more fish biomass. The grazing rate, or, or how fast the reef is being cleaned, was 3.2 times greater. The bioerosion rate, so how, how often the dead corals being removed and the islands are being built, was 3.8 times higher. 
And while the benthic changes are uncertain at this stage, we're, we're going to be able to continue to monitor that. Uh, the enhanced biomass of some key groups of fish has been maintained, which is reassuring. Thank you very much for listening.